Hi everyone, your chess puzzler here, and welcome to the channel. Chess has come a very long way. With the development of new chess engines, I can make a mockery out of our best human chess players. Using technology to improve our play is now not just normal, but also very, very habitual. Though many take the game for granted, if you're a serious player, then you would know there are no shortcuts. In order to excel, you need to put in study plenty of hard work. What I wish to cover today is a true classic. It was a game played between two giants who need no introduction whatsoever. What time period are we looking at? Well, let's do this the other way around. Let me bring up this picture which I brought from the web. Let's see if it's at all recognisable. Can anyone put a finger on its location? This picture actually dates back to 1910. But can anyone really be in any position to put a location? and what this place could be. Well, does this look like Paris? Or could it possibly be London? It could, but it's neither of the above. If I mention two big chess names, any chess enthusiast will be able to put two and two together. So let's try, shall we? Name number one is Ritzy. Name number two is Tatakova. Now that we have identified the players, should have no trouble spotting this place. It's Vienna, right? Just in case it slipped our mind. Or we didn't know about it. When Savielli met Richard, no one knew how this game would end. This encounter between the two giants actually ended as fast as it started. And let's see why. Ritzi is very known for his own openings. You know, no one says one noise if freezer must. He's in this side of the board. Let's see, we have for 1e4. Tatakova responds with a cut row. And even at a time when no software was available, let's see how far these players are removed from reality. Ritzi opted for the usual d4. Savielli brings up this central move. And your south can choose. Any one of many responses. If you opt for the advanced variation, short would tell you the special entry into the game would be ideal. Another way to do it would be to trade in the center. And after the king side and queen side knights are introduced, c3, bishop f5, or even bishop g4 are both moves that can be considered as adequate. However, there is more than meets the eye. When the car appeared, after the knights were introduced, South can also try a type of London system. They can additionally try something like this pin on the knight. But also, if you don't fancy any of these options, there is always this thrust into C4, or a more calm approach, we go for this bishop move right into d3. Okay, let's come back to see how these players went about it in their own game. After this push to d5, this is how Red C went about it. Some players often choose knight d2, but either approach you take has its own pros and cons. Knight c3 or knight d2 aims to deal with the potential takes on e4. Now, when Tatakova went for it, this guy was captured. For anyone using the car or playing either side of the board, it should be very normal. Bishop f5 is normally played after this retaliation takes place. Bishop g6 and knight f3 will lead to a very normal type of development. If we return to the game, to this move when the knight captures the pawn on e4. If you choose to hunt after the knight, 
Now, would you place him? The examples on G5 looks great. If you get confronted by this follow-up threat, the opening on the king side is going to cost you a lot. When you slip in with this check, after his majesty is flushed forwards, anything south does, or mostly anything south does, works a trade. Shall we see if knight of seven to fork the queen and rook is a blunder? Is it? After queenie eyes, how would you deal with this worry? I mean, if you take with a check, and even if the queen comes under fire, after queen f3, always holding onto this knight, should the king sight rook make a run? Bishop d3 is going to scoop up this rook. At the same time, the knight on f7 remains covered. Okay, let's backtrack to explore another owing your play. Well, then take this point. What about you get the queen to move into the sixth? Now, only this rock in the corner is history. But at the same time, his queen on g6 is automatically covered. Now that we looked at some basic variations, when this guy in the fourth went to tackle that, introduce the kingside knight. And in short, what the idea is, is to get the knights to come off. If you go for the knights, what is the best way to capture? If you use the pawn from the outside, after knight f3, rook g8, and obviously something like g3 can lead to this threat. And if you now cover in this way, not per se bishop g4, but something like bishop e6, or even what looks slightly better, this knight moved to the rim. Again, now that we have explored some possible continuations, when to tackle off at the knight, Rook c refuses to swap him, and instead tries this queen move just to be able to cover this knight. And yet, with the tackle considering his options, this is how he chooses to make progress. This is clearly a pawn offer. But is that a trick too? When Reti calculated there was very little mistake, pawn was removed. Quite surprisingly, the queen is not removed, but instead, this how to attack of answers. This check does not necessarily win the pawn when you fight, but it's nevertheless tricky. If you cover the check with the knight, this guy will come off with a follow up check. And if you block with the bishop after bishop e7 and knight f3, queen a5 or queen c7 will open up the game. And from what you see here, all three results will be possible. Coming back, when to tag of our launch this check should you attempt to cover the pawn via this queen response momentarily you would save the pawn but what's the use if you get confronted by this nasty move this is how easy anyone can go wrong and this is how easy you can drop the game so when this check appeared but he chose to attack the queen in this way and when this pawn came off so Tsakova had created a renewed threat right in the middle of the board. But he would like to go over this bishop type of attack, but because so Tsakova is able to remove the knight with a check, if both queens come off, and they will have to, this will be the end of this game. So coming back, let's see, has this push to the third? But what you see here, it would be Tatakova who's pulling all the shots. If everything in the center comes off, it should be seven. Something like knight f3 and now castles, and this game may have to go all the way unless a silly error is made somewhere. Okay, let's return to see where on earth a queen's sacrifice can take place and whether it turns out to be a blunder. Great players are never scared to offer the queen. Not for two rooks, because that would not be seen as a sacrifice. 
There are special cases where some have dropped the queen for a single minor piece, where Slito is known to have handed over his queen for two minor pieces, Wesley also surrendered his queen in at least 10 other games. But also, that means some others who offer their own queen if they are able to get the job done. When Tatakova, at this point, eliminated, but he calculated best to castle, and when he did so, this knight on e4 can no longer be gained unless you want to drop the queen or, in some cases, get checkmated. This is quite straightforward to demonstrate. If you take with the queen, if the rookie won, the queen will need to drop, nor you gain is the knight and the rook to the very queen, but it's what you see here game over. Not by a long shot, though Red Sea will be up, his job is far from done. Having said this, after Bishop E7, Queen E2 to stop the king from castling, fall short to this bishop move. But who wouldn't prefer to have this side of the ward? Coming back to one of the critical points in the game, right after Red Sea castled, Bishop E7, for example, will lead or can lead to the removal of the knights. And with attack we're being forced to get rid of the knights with the queen. Does this new attack on the queen work? It could work, but first, there is this incoming check around the corner. If you get the king to move out, should you now get the king to safety? That red C would have the upper hand whatever this upper hand might be. Looks to be very small. I'm not too sure if you like this position using an engine is going to show anything significant, but if I were to choose sides, I wouldn't mind taking either. Okay, now that we have looked at the what ifs of Bishop E7, the attack of a hat looks at something different. It was calculating if it was at all safe to get rid of this knight from E4, but if you wanted to do it, you had to do this using the knight, of course. In the end, you had to go for it. When this knight was taken, Tatakova made some calculations. But what were these calculations? Well, let's try and get into issues. If you go for this rook move, if you now answer with this response to f5, this push to f3 to attack the knight, for sure is going to drop him. If you, all you get here is a knight for a knight, but what is the fuss? This position is quite interesting, especially if it is one you had not seen before. If you try this very beautiful knight move to a6, should you grab hold of the knight? This knight on a6 has some added power. And you get him to chase after the queen, you're no longer able to remove this guy from f5 to expose the queens because red c falls short by one move. If you first get rid of the queen with an incoming check, even if the knight goes, if both rooks and queen drop, if the bishop e7, you tell me what side has the upper hand. So coming back, after this hypothetical rook move to e1, Tatakova may have something stronger than just to go for this move to f5. What or how far will this bishop entry into the fifth will get you? f3 going for the knight can lead to this knight to develop, and even if the knight falls, provided you go for something like bishop g6 or even bishop e6, at least north will be fine. After this bishop move to f5, what if you, what if south? Delay the attack on the knight with f3 and instead goes for this attack on the bishop. If you take, that would be it. But if you back off to e6, after this knight bites the dust, when you back off here, majesty to safety, it's again one of those positions that do look to be equal. However, this is not what happened in this game between Red Sea and Tatakova. When it came to this knight taking on e4, 
Can you possibly work out what rookie one does? Let's give you a few seconds to try and work it out. Should you need more time, we can always pause. Okay, now that we have had some time to think about it, it's the wrong move. And let's hear this sound for a change. We've seen this before, this bishop moving to f5 is key. If you chase after this knight with a 3, both or either queen c5 or knight d7 are very playable. Knight d7, for example, drops the knight. After this bishop backs off to either, well, e6 or g6, should the queen come under fire, queen c7 will be the ideal response in this position. What if, instead of rook e1, red t opted for this attack on the queen. If you go queen d5, should the queens come off? After bishop e3, bishop e6 will not do it. Why not? Try this knight move. Should the knight be challenged, this will be the move to go for. Rook c will or can lead to this rook repositioning and red c will be a sitting duck. Can you see why? The bishop e7, king b1, and if you allow castles, take the bishop, take the knight, and everything breaks wide open. When you attack the knight, this knight has no good squares to escape to. Knight d6, We'll get this bishop to back off, and though this position looks equal, it's far from it. g6, for example, something like a3 or even g3, and red c is toast. h5, for example, bishop f4 and knight f5, and this bishop move right into d3, and this guy on the sixth is now target. Knight d8 looks to be in time. But after c3, a6, and rook e2, is there any real need to get his majesty going? Chase after the knight, escape to this outpost, and you know, since this knight on h4 cannot get trapped, with the minor piece up to tackle that, we'll be able to snatch this one, irrespective of how he plays it. Okay, now they have come this far to explain if you what is, maybe it's time to show what this critical takes only for actually means. We looked at what both rookie one and knight f3 do, when something we had not even considered is if red c was going to chase after the knight in this way. This is something you could consider. If this bishop comes off, should you take with the king? so that you can get in rook e1 is not going to work. If you hit this guy off with the queen, this incoming check automatically backfires to this type of response. And if red c cannot find an instant solution, allow bishop b4 and red c will need a miracle to be able to come out with this one in one piece. If you now take care of this knight with the rook to tackle it's just in time to bring out his bishop. Rook e2 is met by this queen move. And however you choose to play it, Red C will always be playing catch up. So, do things change if South will grab hold of this knight using the queen? Once the Takwa gets his bishop move in, Red C can basically forget it. Rook e1 and queen c5. And again, this one is over finito. Coming back for the very last time, in respect of everything we tried, one move appears to stand out. Find it, and you should be able to get there. We have tried actually 
before. In another edition I brought out, and it came in the form of puzzle. Can you spot the one and only move that makes all the difference? And if so, what did Ritchie do? And how did he manage to meet his goal? If you need a hint, the key to everything is this rook on d1. And of course, some other minor piece to carry out the blow. What move did Ritchie go for? This was that move. That made all the difference. If you found it, with the king forced to take the queen, Ritchie picks up this bishop. When you place him on this outpost on g5, not only the bishop delivers his check, but it all came down to the double check. Because there is no way to block a double check with a single move, or at least not in this case. When Tatakova moved his king to the only legal square he could, when this blow appeared, not only another check materialized, with the king not able to go anywhere. This is also what you call a first class checkmate. And before we forget, let's hear it for the first and probably the last time today. Checkmate, amigo. What we witnessed today was in fact a true miniature of just 11 moves long. But see, he found the only move that mattered. And even Tatakova was powerless to act upon. So, on a bad day, or on a very bad move, even great chess players are not immune to blunders. The temptation to get rid of the knight from e4 is what caused Tatakova to go south, and south he went as soon as Ritzi sacrificed his queen. Some people say this queen's sacrifice is one of the greatest ones in history. But of course, this is such a subjective issue, with many people disagreeing. In any way, it is one short game where plenty of lessons can be learned. So next time when you see anything like this, take your time and just hope you will go for the right move. If you didn't spot this ingenious check to offer up the queen, worry not. Now that we have seen it, let's hope we will not forget it. And this is how we'd like to end things for today. Your chess puzzler here, and you know the drill. Safety always first. Mm -hmm.